Julius Nyerere was Tanzania's first president. Tanzania's independence from the British was achieved and without bloodshed. Nyerere, a teacher by profession, chose politics over teaching, traveled throughout the country, speaking to tribal chiefs and common people about the case of independence. He forged a relationship with British Governor Sir Richard Turnbull and convinced London to allow elections. On the 9th of December 1961, Tanzania became a nation. Known as Mwalimu, the Swahili word for teacher, Nyerere had a vision of education and social action that is his legacy. This house here is where, when my, while my father was president, that's the house where we used to come to when he, um, when, we, when he used to spend his end of the year holidays in December. So that's the only house where, which he, he owned at that time, apart from the other house he has in, in Dar es Salaam, which he built uh, uh, through a, gov uh, um, a bank loan. Now. Even his colleagues uh, in government, when they saw this house, they felt that it was too small, even for a socialist president. <laughs> and so they decided to build uh, another house for him on the other side of the village. Um, and, uh, and that's where, uh, from around the 1980s, uh, where he used to stay. It's a childhood which, um, we didn't have so much contact with with families of other leaders, of other heads of state uh, or presidents. I remember the only time that we had contact with another family was with President Kaunda's family. When we were growing up, we didn't have anything to compare our childhood with. And we were taken to to schools which every other Tanzanian went to, um, so we didn't go to any special schools. Nyerere has been described as cheerful, always seen smiling and being a man of the people. I went into villages where he was talking and being with people, and then later I was with him when he met Prince Charles, and the thing that struck me all the time is he talked to that dignitary Prince Charles, in the same way he talked to the mama in the village, to the Mze in the village, to the child in the village. His, his thing for me was everybody was important. And he addressed everybody with taking time and speaking with them, and that taught me a lot. This is uh, my father's uh collection of books. There are all types of subjects. There is a large section on philosophy. Uh, we have books on politics. On, oh, we have autobiographies. We have uh, books on agriculture, on religion. Almost, almost everything. There are more than 8,000 books here. And he, um, he read a lot of books all the time. And so most of the books in here, he actually bought himself. But some of the books were given to him by various authors, and sometimes by individuals who thought might, he might be interested to read uh, a certain book. And he read almost everything which is in here. <laughs> Education is being given lip service, I think, because we still depend on the government to, to deliver education to, to the people. But the problem is this, we, there's emphasis on buildings, so 
when you travel around the country, you'll see a lot of buildings. Uh, this is there's a primary school, there's a secondary school. But the quality of education uh, does not match the investment which we have in buildings. Before independence, education was not for all in Tanzania. Nyerere put in place an educational policy called Education for Self-Reliance. This was to ensure that as many Tanzanian children from all communities could get equal learning opportunities. The beneficiaries of this education system look back and compare those times to the present. I can say the quality of education, the quality of teachers we had, the quality of knowledge we were being given in primary and secondary school was better than we are, what we are having to, today. I went to a government school. I attended all of my education was through um, government school. It's very strange for us who, uh, you know, graduated, uh, who went to school in those years to see, you know, kids sitting on the floor. At least everyone had a decent, you know, desk seat. At least everyone was, you know, had a book. Uh, it's news to us that the kids are sharing books uh, now. So everything was almost adequate. Secondary school was where identity started changing. It's because for the first time you went to a school where there were peasants who ran seven miles to school with the shoes in their hands when in the rainy season. Because if you had any dirt on your shoes or your socks, that's it, you were canned. Discipline was very um, strong. Nyerere was a patron of the arts and culture in Tanzania. He supported Sister Jean Pruitt in establishing Nyumbayasana, a cultural center and art workshop. The center was intended to promote local fine art and many of Tanzania's leading artists began their careers there. This is the draft of the book that I began. The intention of the book, as we're speaking of Mwaili Munyeri, is the intention really to preserve his legacy, his legacy to artists. It was he who gave us that land, and it was he who gave us the entree to the donors to build this wonderful gallery and home for artists. And uh, so uh, one of the ways to preserve that legacy is to preserve the art that was produced over 30, 30 years in the in this sacred space of Nubia Sana. We had our first exhibition in 1975 at the National Museum. We had beautiful textiles at that time, uh, wonderful woodcuts, watercolors. So um, they had these wonderful watercolors and um, uh, woodcuts and just fabulous works of art. And then that reminded me, reminds me of Mailimu. One day I get this little envelope of red seeds and he sends me a note I found these on the grounds don't you think you can make nice use these for for nice jewelry and so yes we made earrings and we sent them to him. this is what you know so he was even always mindful of of us in so many ways that he found these beautiful red seeds and they do make wonderful beads for jewelry so we made we made Nyerere red seed jewelry <laughs> Kwa nakumbuka niliwahi kupata oda kutoka kwa mwalimu kute alikuwa anataka kupeleka zawadi Nigeria nadhani kwa baba Ngida akienda nje mara nyingi kazi naifanya mimi kwa hiyo nilikuwa nikifanya hiyo micho sasa kama mara tatu alikuwa akija kuchukua kazi zinahitaji kwa micholo bwana uchole mwalimu anahitaji nikinachola anakupelekewa sasa siku ya kukutana ilikuwa hiyo siku ya ufunguzi niona sasa leo tutakutana na mwalimu Kwa hiyo kwa kweli hiyo siku ilikuwa siku maalum kwangu na kwa sababu naelewa mwalimu anatusaidia sana mara nyingine anatoa support nyingi hapa sasa ilikuwa kitu kwangu ni maalum kwa hiyo sasa nakutana na mwalimu mwenyewe basi ni kitu kizuri Mwalimu Nyerere ni mtu wa kawaida kwa kweli alipokuja baada ya kunigusa 
nikasikia mwili unasisimka alafu baadaye nikamzoea lakini akawa ananiuliza maswali baadaye tena akaniuliza kama je ulijifunza sehemu yoyote kama Ulaya au wapi nikamwambia mimi sija, sijawahi kufika Ulaya na sitegemei kwa hali hii kufika Ulaya lakini alitamka pale pale mwalimu Nyerere kwamba kama hujapita Ulaya sasa ni wakati wako kwa ujuzi kama huu utapita kila mara Ulaya kweli milango ilifunguka na ndio mwanzo wa kuanza sasa kwenda Ulaya baada ya tamko lake kwa kweli niliona ni miujiza mikubwa sana alizungumza alafu baadaye ilikuwa vile nimekwenda Ulaya mpaka safari nikachukia kwa naenda Ulaya leo wanapanga nenda Ulaya nikasema ah naenda kule kule kwa kweli ilikuwa ni ah, ilikuwa ni miujiza mikubwa sana alafu kila mara nikienda Ulaya nikiwa Ulaya nakumbuka sauti ya mwalimu Nyerere kila nikienda Ulaya nakumbuka sauti ya mwalimu Nyerere Nyerere art was it's like a soul of a nation and he keep on referring to that phrase that if a nation doesn't have art or does not have any culture for that matter it's like a dead body <laughs> you cannot survive without culture but when he was talking about culture specifically he was referring to the arts especially the performing arts the theater dances etc storytelling and other traditional african forms so for him he believed that art has a role to play in the nation development during his time he struggled to put art as part of the subjects in classes and also encourages the organizations and government ministries agencies departments to have groups performing groups although on one hand it has been seen like it is kind of a propaganda kind of art but it's a, it made the, the art more visible than we are doing today. As the nation's first president, Julius Nyerere implemented an economic program that many labeled socialist. He introduced a policy of collectivization in the country's agricultural system known as Ujama or familyhood. We had to take measures to stop famine. Actually, people are not dying. People have not died of starvation in Tanzania since we took over. They were dying before we took over. Nyerere aimed to make people return to their traditional modes of life before British colonial influences. First and foremost, the peasant. The peasant. Because he's the producer of the food for the majority of the population of any country in Africa at present. So first of all, pay that attention to the peasant. Take the peasant and treat him as a god. In the agriculture sector, villages were set up across Tanzania with the aim of growing food, both for domestic use and sale. I think it was very, as I say, very interesting period. Um, in 1967, when Yara uh, declared the party adopted Ujama, uh, the policy of Ujama and Kujitegemea, meaning socialism and self-reliance. There are many factors, I'm not going to that. But I think the important point was that it was a kind of a climax of, a radic of radical nationalism. And people who talk about this nonsense, about, uh, about uh, the, the socialism failing, they talk a lot of rubbish. There's no proof. It's something they've read and they, they say Tanzania is socialist. Tanzania has problems about food. Therefore, it must be because they're socialist that they have problems about food. But I'm telling you in the meantime, the best, the best farms in Tanzania, the best farms in Tanzania in the production of wheat or in the production of maize or in the production of, uh, of, of rice are state run. Rumor had it that we had deliberately refused to import things so that we can, you know, improve our, our local production. Um, that was one of the reasons. So I, I never, nobody used to complain. You will never hear anyone complaining about the leadership then. We knew whatever we were going through, it's because it's, it's for the better. Had we not been socialists, we would have collapsed. <laughs> you just simply go around, I'm saying, go around and discover. 
that had we not been socialist, had we not been following the policies which we announced in 1967, we would have collapsed. <laughs> This house was built uh, for my father by the Tanzanian army as a present to him, the commander in chief, um, for winning the war um, against Uganda's uh, Idi Amin. Um, that was in 1979. The Uganda war was fought between Uganda and Tanzania in 1978 to 1979. After Amin seized power in a military coup in 1971, Nyerere offered safety to Uganda's ousted president, Milton Obote. Amin blamed Nyerere for backing and arming his enemies. Uganda declared a state of war against Tanzania and sent troops to capture part of the Kagera region of Tanzania, which Amin claimed belonged to Uganda. And then came this invasion of Kagera. I mean, claiming certain parts of Tanganyika. So long as he was simply talking that in the speeches, it was fine, it could be answered. But then he actually moved his troops. Now that is where Walimu had to take a position, okay, and prepare to defend the territory integrity of the country. And that is how the war broke out. Nyerere mobilized the Tanzanian People's Defense Forces and counterattacked. In a few weeks, the Tanzanian army was expanded from less than 40,000 troops to over 100,000. The Ugandan army retreated steadily. The effect of that war on the country, yeah, was enormous. Economically, it was enormous. Uh, it was a turning point in many ways, uh, from which we could not easily recover. Now, that accompanied by the economic crisis, the war and then the overall international economic crisis, is when we then began to get into real problems. And the last five years of Malibu, from 1985, were very bad for Tanzania, economically speaking. For when President Nelson Mandela took his seat to represent a non-racial, post-apartheid, democratic South Africa, the final objective, the first objective of the Founding Fathers had been achieved. Our continent had been totally liberated from colonialism and racial minority rule. A diehard supporter of African liberation, Nyerere welcomed freedom fighters from all over the continent into Tanzania in the 1960s and 70s. Nyerere, along with other Pan-Africanist leaders, founded the Organization of African Unity in 1963. Nyerere supported several militant groups active in Africa. The whole of 60s, all over Africa, it was the nationalist period, the liberation movements, because some countries had not yet obtained their independence, the Southern African countries, and one of the important uh, uh, positions of the OAU, which actually Mwalimu pushed, was the liberation of the whole of Africa, the end of colonialism. The high mark uh, would be the, the Lusaka Manifesto of 1968, you know, where the countries of the region, you know, declared why they had to opt for, 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 for armed struggle. This struggle for freedom lasted for 30 years, from the inception of the Organization of African Unity in 1963 to the independence of South Africa in 1994. When Mandela and Winnie came to Tanzania, oh, I just wanted so bad to meet Mandela. And of course, Malima knew this. And so the day that he was here, I didn't know the arrangements, of course, and I had already booked. I had a, a meeting in Arusha, so I had a ticket. I was on the way out of my door, and here's a state house car coming to pick me up to go and meet Mandela. And I couldn't go, because I had this commitment. So I was so sad, because I had to go. I just couldn't keep this commitment. So when I got back, I got this call from Wailimo, and he says, 
come to my house for dinner. So I went to his house and he says, since you miss Mandela, you can sit with me and we can watch Mandela. <laughs> visit to Tanzania. So here I am sitting beside, and of course tears falling down my face, you know, the, watching with Mwalimu the visit of Mandela. That was an awesome moment for me. Nyerere became the first chairman of the Frontline States, and in 1976, he invited other prominent leaders to Tanzania for talks he hoped would lead to majority rule for white minority run Rhodesia. 1980 was a proud year when Rhodesia became the independent Zimbabwe. <laughs> Namibia too fought hard to free itself from the clutches of South Africa, and Nyerere vowed to help. In 1968, Samuel Nujoma, president of Southwest Africa People's Organization, SWAPO, flew to Tanzania to attend talks at the Council for Southwest Africa. Nujoma's army of freedom fighters was engaged in a grisly war against white South African soldiers, trying desperately to hold on to their colony. In 1990, Namibia celebrated Independence Day and Nujoma was sworn in as president. I have claimed that the third world does exist and has a meaning which can be used for the betterment of the masses of poor people in the world. Nyerere once said, without unity there is no future for Africa. Through his role in the liberation of African states, he stood true to these words. My warning to our people is directed at both ends. Never be complacent. Always examine yourself. Can't you do better? Couldn't you do better? But don't be so self-critical that, that you despair. Despair is the unforgivable sin. Julius Nyerere died of leukemia in 1999 in a London hospital, but he will be remembered and revered in Tanzania for generations to come. This mausoleum was built as part uh, of the construction of the house. Actually, when he was buried in 1999, it was just an open grave. Uh, it was not open, actually. A grave, but uh, with just with a shelter, with a simple shelter. And it was about two years later that it was decided uh, to build this mausoleum around, around here. So I'm sure if he knew about this, he would have left instructions not to have any complicated structure around his, around his grave. I was a first year student at the University of Dar es Salaam. And, the, and when the news broke, there was mass cry from the halls of residence everybody was like shocked crying and that was so tough because people knew he was sick but the fact that he has, he has he has died that becomes an issue so you could feel like the generation we were at the university of dar es salaam it's not that generation you could say we were we worked with mualim no we were the people who you, we used to to read and perhaps the last product of his leadership and that was, that's the memory I can remember, but people were really crying, shouting. And almost for the, about two weeks or so, things were in a standstill. I was with him when he left Tanzania. I was at the plane and with the family when he left. And he was quite unwell at the time. And even there, we were talking about New Biasana. There we were talking about the future of New Biasana and the difficulties. In his last hours in Tanzania, we were talking about Nimbias and his concerns and his worries. And um, so and I received his blessing as he got on, on the plane and he went off. Kwa kweli nilikuwa na majonzi makubwa sana. Hata nikikumbuka vile alivyokuwa anaongea, alivyo ni alivyo ni hosia siku ile na kunipa baraka zile za kwamba 
e, utakwenda Ulaya mara, mara nyingi. Kwa kweli nilijisikia vibaya sana. Mwalimu was uh, during the time that he was dying everybody was fixed to their to the radios to the telephone talk to the taxi driver talk to the shopkeeper everybody was was attuned to this illness of a great father of their country and they as a father they were that attuned everywhere everywhere and tears that were flowing in this country even now A devout Catholic, Nyerere is being considered for sainthood. Catholic bishops in Tanzania have begun the process. If this process is successful, he will become the first president to be made a saint. Yes, he is being considered for sainthood. During the process, um, uh, Catholics are, are encouraged to pray uh, to the candidate for certain miracles. One of the things he said, I don't want things named after me, and um, and he didn't. He didn't want things marked for him. He didn't want his things named for him. So this canonization is even most uncomfortable. But the first stage of the, and the first title that you get is Servant of God. And I said, yeah, he would like that. Yare was a political leader. He was not a leader, a church leader. He was not a clergyman. He was not the leader of a particular community or particular faith. He was a political leader. I mean, he's a man of, of great... Uh, when I look at his picture, you know, I, I miss him still. I really miss him. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, 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 oh yeah,